The subject of this I world will be the gospel addresses the sin problem. Brother Bruce Stulting, who is a preacher for the Fish Hatchery Road Congregation in Huntsville and serving as one of their elders, will be the speaker at this particular time. Bruce and I go back all the way to where he started school. And that was a long time ago, Bruce. 87. Hmm. You realize there are people in this, in this auditorium that uh, think 87 might have been 1902 or something. <laughs> anyway, I've known him and known of his work, known of his good wife, and their love for the truth and their labors in the kingdom. And we're thankful for his sacrificial service to God. Bruce was born and raised in Carn City, Texas. And he graduated from the Southwest School of Bible Studies in 1989. We didn't even have to keep him, kick him out. Do you remember your oral exams? I just wanted to make sure because we want it to be a memorial occasion. <laughs> okay. He participated in the graduate program at Memphis School of Preaching, 98 to 2000. And he's done mission work in the Philippines and Cambodia. In fact, we ran into one another in a proper way of saying that in the Philippines one time. He holds gospel meetings hither and yon and speaks on various lectureships. He's conducted evangelistic campaigns in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri, and worked in several Bible youth camps, as we well know here. And he served on the faculty of the Rose City Bible Learning Center in Little Rock, Arkansas. He's done local work in Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, and has been working with the Fish Hatchery Road Congregation since 2001. I said earlier he serves also as one of the elders, and we're grateful to have all the elders here from there. He works secularly for the Texas Department of Transportation, so he's a tent-making preacher and we're thankful that he continues to preach while he makes tents. Now, he literally doesn't make tents for the state of Texas. That's going to challenge your knowledge of what Paul did to support himself. But we're thankful to have him speak to us. And if he will now come and address the gospel, addresses the sin problem. Brother Bruce, come speak to us. Good morning, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity to be here once again to speak before this congregation. And uh, really uh, appreciate the congregation here, the elders, the good work that they're doing here. They're standing for the truth throughout the years, always been consistent in standing for the truth, and that's very important, uh, especially in the condition the church is in uh, today. So, really appreciate this congregation. Always a pleasure to be here among the brethren. I hold you all dear to my heart and uh, look forward to being here at every opportunity. This morning, as David said, we're going to be talking about the gospel addresses the sin problem. And I was getting this lesson together and I'm thinking, you know, what text would be perfect for this lesson? And I settled on Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. So if you'd open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, we're going to read that to get us started this morning. Paul, of course, writing to the church at Ephesus, chapter 2. And you did he make alive when you were dead through your trespasses and sin, wherein ye once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the powers of the air, of the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also all uh, once lived in the lust of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace have ye been saved and raised us up with him and made us to sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus." 
For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, that no man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God before prepared that we should walk in them. So, you know, if you ask the average man on the street, what is the greatest problem you're facing today, you're probably going to get a different answer from everybody, right? In fact, some people might say, well, I'm worried about the upcoming election. I'm worried about the, the war that broke out in the Ukraine. I'm worried about, uh, you know, my job. I'm worried about my health. I'm worried about uh, whether or not I'm going to be accepted as transgender. I'm worried about uh, what the government, if they're going to keep sending me my uh, things I'm entitled to, you know, the freebies. And, you know, I'm just worried about all kind of things. And so when we think about this answer that people would give, it's directly related to what they hold most important at that time. Now, the thing is, when you ask the average man on the street what his greatest problem is, one thing you probably won't hear is my greatest problem is sin. Because we live in, a lot of people live in the world, and they think like the world, and that's a problem. Today's sin is often taken too lightly by the world, and even it's getting that way in the church. The church is beginning to take sin too lightly. I sometimes wonder if good and thoughtful people, even brethren, have ever been more depressed about the human predicament than they are today. You know, the media enables us to grasp the worldwide extent of contemporary evil. The spread of social conflict, racism, tribalism, the class struggle, uh, disintegrating family life, all of that's right in front of us every day. The absence of accepted moral guidelines leading to violence, dishonesty, and sexual promiscuity. Man seems incapable of managing his own affairs and creating a just, free, humane, and tranquil society. Against the somber background of the text that we just read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, this situation becomes very relevant, relevant for us today. The first three chapters, our first three verses in this chapter, uh, and the reality of the human condition today demands some conclusions. Number one, man is incapable of solving his own problems without God. 2,000 years ago, this text was written, and all that time has passed, and we haven't even eradicated one sin on our own. In fact, because of the population increased during that period of time, it appears that the condition is just deteriorating and getting worse and worse. In fact, it seems that addictive and deviant human behaviors have multiplied. And the answer is not found in technology. The answer is not found in social science or psychology. Money and federal programs have not solved our moral problems. Social idealism of the 60s didn't help. Sin is man's greatest enemy. It's man's greatest problem. Because it's the only thing that will keep us out of heaven and send us to hell. And I think that for the most part, mankind has lost that idea. The Bible definition of sin is found in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, where John writes that sin is the transgression of God's law. Sin is a violation of God's law. It's a failure to do what you know is right, James chapter 1 or chapter 4 and verse 17. It even involves doing that which violates your conscience, even though the thing you do might be right in and of itself, if you think it's wrong and you go ahead and do it anyway, it's a sin. 
because you violated your conscience. Romans 14 and verse 23. Sin is man's greatest problem because it's universal. Romans chapter 3, or chapter, uh, yeah, chapter 3 and verse 23 simply states that all have fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Romans chapter 3 and verse 9 and 10. The wages, the consequences, what we earn because of our sin is death. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Even so, I'm not sure that many people, even some Christians, truly appreciate the problem of sin and how the gospel of Christ effectively addresses this problem. You know, we think about the problem of sin, we want to start out, and we're going to just break it down a little bit into subcategories. And we talk about the love of sin. Nobody's going to commit sin if it's, obvious that it's hurtful or harmful or that it's something that condemns you. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 and verse 25, it talks about Moses when he became of age, he chose to suffer with his people rather than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. There is pleasure in sin. It's a false sense of pleasure. But if sin wasn't fun, nobody would be doing it. If there wasn't some attraction to it, they would, it would be stayed away from. But sin, Satan makes sin look good. He makes it look attractive. He makes it look beneficial. And he makes it something that you want to do. That's called temptation, James chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Sinful pleasures blind people to the truth, John 3 and verse 19. And then we talk about the practice of sin. We've already seen Romans 3 and verse 23, all have uh, sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So it's a universal problem. It's not a localized problem. It's not something that affects part of society and not all of society. But all have sinned. Even some church members are drawn back into this life of sin as we see in John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. We can't deny the fact even as Christians, that we commit momentary acts of sin. We either lie to ourselves or we make God a liar. The text in, encourages us to acknowledge our sin. And if we acknowledge our sin, God is just and righteous to, to forgive us of those sins, to cleanse us of all iniquity, it says. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, wherein you once walked according to the course of this world. You know, in that text, when we talk about the universal nature of sin, he starts out and he talks about you referring to the Gentiles. And then later in verse 3, he talks about we also. That's talking about the Jews. When Paul uses in this context you, he's talking about the Gentiles. When he talks about we, he's talking about the Jews. And if you put the Jews and the Gentiles together, that doesn't leave anybody out. Paul says this, this, you know, this sin problem is universal. And we walk in and it's not just an isolated failure here or there in these people's lives. This is a way of life. Sin is a way of life. And then we talk about the state of sin. Those who love and practice sin are dead in sin. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. The place... This places people in the state of being dead to God. The idea of being dead simply means a separation. If you're talking about physical death, that means my spirit is separated from my body. And that's death. When we think about that, that's physical death. When we talk about spiritual death, that's when I, as a, an individual... When I commit sin, then I am spiritually dead. In other words, I'm separated from God. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. God's hand is not slack that He cannot save. His ear is not weak that He cannot hear. But your sins have separated you from your God. That's what sin does. It causes this spiritual death. Back in Genesis chapter 2 and, verse, and chapter 3, talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when 
God forbid Adam and Eve from eating that fruit. He said, the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Well, when they ate that fruit, they died spiritually and were separated from God. And we need to recognize that. Sin is a serious problem. Sin kills innocence. You know, there's a false doctrine called total depravity that teaches that babies are born in sin. They inherit sin. They inherit a corrupt nature. They're totally depraved and incapable of doing any good thing. That's as far from the truth as can possibly be. Babies are innocent. And sin kills that innocent. No one is precisely the same after he has sinned. The experience of sin had left a kind of tarnishing film on his mind. And things could never be quite the same again. You always have that in your mind that you've sinned. You've transgressed God's Word. you left the state of innocent and you've entered the state of spiritual death. Sin kills our ideals. Each sin makes the next sin easier. Sin is kind of a suicide. It kills the ideals which make life worthwhile. And in the end, sin kills the will, our determination to do what's right. At first, a man engages in some forbidden pleasure because he wants to do so. But in the end, he engages in it because he cannot help doing so. Once a thing becomes a habit, it's, off, it's not far from becoming a necessity. Because sin kills the ideals of man, men begin to do without qualms the thing which once they regarded with horror. Sin kills the will. The thing so grips a man that he can't break free. I've heard it put this way one time. You've probably heard this too. Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and cost you more than you wanted to pay. That's the idea here, where, it's, where we're talking about it kills your, 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 your ideals. It kills your will, your, your desire to do good. The more you sin, and the more you get comfortable in sin, it's going to be harder to come out of that sin. The Bible talks about those that have had their conscience seared as with a hot iron. Those who have stopped up their ears and closed their eyes so they can't see and hear the truth. That talks about some that are beyond reach. That's what we're talking about. Sometimes sin gets such a hold on an individual that it's hard to break away. It's hard to get free. I've studied with individuals and this has happened on more than one occasion. We talk about sin, talk about the consequences of sin, just like we're doing here this morning. And then I get down and talk about the cure for sin, the gospel of Jesus Christ that we're going to talk about uh, in a few minutes. And I've seen people sit across the kitchen table for me and cry bitter tears. And I'm encouraging them to obey the gospel. And then they respond and say, I'm not ready to give up the world. They know what they need to do. They know their spiritual condition, that they're lost, they're, they're heading to a devil's hell. And they're crying bitter tears of remorse, but there's no repentance because they do not experience godly sorrow. They experience regret, not ready to give up the world. You see, that's what sin does. That's the problem. That's the, the poison nature of sin. It'll get a hold of you and won't let you go. And it's hard to break free. Sin kills truthfulness, industry, integrity, and virtue. Yet a state of death infers a previous life. You can't die if you weren't alive. Do you understand what I'm getting at here? That goes back to that total depravity idea. I can't die unless I was once alive. We're not born in sin. Sin is something we do and not something we inherit. 
And that goes back to the very definition the Bible gives us of 1 John chapter 4 and verse 3. Sin is transgression of the law. It's what I do. I don't inherit it from anybody. It's what I do, and I suffer the consequences of my own sin. And once we commit that sin, whether by commission, omission, or violating our conscience, then we have the guilt of sin. And we can look at this in two ways. When we think about the guilt of sin, we're guilty. Okay? You know, when we think about standing in the judgment, it's not going to be to determine whether or not we're guilty of sin or not. We're already guilty of sin. That's just going to be to pass judgment. That's going to be, okay, you're guilty of sin, and, and you didn't take the, the proper steps to correct those, those sins according to the Scriptures. And you're cast into outer darkness. There's weeping and gnashing of teeth. A devil's hell for eternity. But those that committed sin and came to God in, in humble obedience to the plan of salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're going to hear the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in the joy of the Lord. You see the great contrast there? And it's all based on the fact that we've all sinned. But you know, our text says God had mercy in His great mercy wherewith He loved us. We spend a lot of time talking about grace, don't we? And grace is important. In fact, our text talks about grace. We're saved by grace through faith. And without God's grace, there is no salvation. But what motivates God to extend grace? Mercy. Mercy. What causes God to have mercy upon the sinner? It's our choice. We chose to do it. We could, we could obey God or disobey God. We chose to disobey God just as Eve did in the garden so long ago. But God has mercy on us. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. The whole verse there says, God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Our text this morning talks about the love and mercy of God. God extends grace because He has mercy, and God has mercy because He loves us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Sin is a problem, and it is a, a, a horrible problem. It has power over us, the power to enslave us. In John chapter 8 and verse 34, everyone that commits sin is the bondservant of sin. And I'll tell you what, that conversation there in chapter 8 of John is amazing. They said, we're the sons of Abraham. We've never been in bondage. Well, I guess they forgot about that little time they spent in Egypt, right? But Jesus is not talking about physical bondage here. He's talking about spiritual bondage. Just like we're talking about, this, so we're, we're slaves to the powers of this world, to Satan, when we commit sin. You know, Jesus said, you know, if you were the children of Abraham, you would do the works of Abraham. But you've tried to kill me. Abraham never tried to do that. And they go back and forth. And Jesus finally says, you're of your father the devil. You're of your father, the devil. You know, preachers from the pulpit today, if you say that, you might get fired if you told the brethren at the congregation where you preach, you know, you're of the devil because you act like the devil. That's what Jesus was saying. You're of your father, the devil, and his works you will do. That's the power of sin. It enslaves us. Whomsoever you yield your members to obey his servants, you are whom you obey. Whether of sin unto death or righteousness unto life. Romans chapter 6. Know about verse 17 and 18. Think about that, folks. 
sin enslaves us. It condemns our soul to hell. Of course, the wages of sin, we've already said, is death. Romans 6 and verse 23 includes the idea of separation of the body from the spirit. James 2 and verse 26. And the result of sin is spiritual death, separation from God. And if we don't do something about it in obedience to the gospel, it's going to be for eternity. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 45. Eternal punishment. Unending torment in a devil's hell for eternity. That's what awaits the sinner. You see, that's the sin problem. But our text does say that God loves us and He's merciful toward us and He's, it offers grace to us. We think about the grace of God. How does the gospel of Christ address the sin problem? Now keep it in mind that when we think about the gospel, the gospel consists of facts to believe. It consists of commands to obey and it promises to receive. When we think about the facts to believe, they're summed up for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you'll turn there with me. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, and we'll look at verses 1 through 4. Now, make, uh, now I make known unto you, brethren, the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye received, wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if, if you hold fast the word which I preached unto you, except ye believed in vain. So far, Paul preached the gospel, they accepted it, and they responded to it. Notice he says they're standing, they're abiding in the gospel. And so it takes not just the grace of the gospel being preached and the, and the message of the gospel, it has to do with the response of the individual to the gospel. And it goes on in verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Jesus died on the cross According to prophecy, Isaiah chapter 53, Acts chapter 8, Ethiopian nobleman's going along in his chariot. He's returning back to Ethiopia and having worshipped in Jerusalem. And he's reading Isaiah chapter 53 about the vicarious sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But he's having a little trouble understanding the text. Philip comes up and he asks him, do you understand what you read? And he said, how can I except some man teach me. He asked the question, is this man, the prophet, speaking of himself or some other man? And so Philip began at that scripture and preached Jesus to him. He preached the gospel. And he goes on, I delivered what, what uh, first of all, uh, that which I received, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he has been raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So the preaching of the gospel includes the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that was all fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. It was according to the scriptures. And he did that. Jesus went to the cross and died not for anything that he was guilty of. Not for his own sins, but he bare our sins on the cross. These things which God has done make it possible for the commandments and promises of the gospel to really address the problem of sin. So how does the gospel address the problem of sin? Believing in Christ addresses the love of sin. Right? Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Our love has to change from a love of sin to a love of Christ. We have to make that change. Because as long as we love sin, we're never going to love Christ. But if we love Christ, we cannot and must not love sin. It's, it's an either or situation. It's one or the other. 
They will have the attitude expressed by the psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 104. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. I can't love the truth without hating error. That's the way it goes. It's Again, it's an either or situation. Jesus put it this way in, John, in Matthew chapter 6. You can't serve two masters. You'll love the one and hate the other. You'll hold the one, despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon at the same time. It's that simple. The point is, true faith helps to eliminate our love for sin. When the Bible calls upon us to repent of our sins in passages like Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, when Peter and the eleven are preaching that first gospel sermon of the day of Pentecost, the birth of the church, the, the, the people were pricked in their heart. And they cried out in desperation. Can you imagine hearing the words, this same Jesus whom you crucified, God's made Lord in Christ, and think about how that made them feel? We've killed the Messiah. We've killed the Christ. We've killed the one we've been waiting for. We've killed the Savior. What hope is there for us now? Men and brethren, they cried out. Men and brethren, what shall we do? They stopped the sermon, David. You get that? I've had people stop the sermon when I was preaching before, but it wasn't ever to ask what they needed to do to be saved. I told them what they needed to do to be saved in my response. But uh, they stopped the sermon. It was that important. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent. Repent ye and be baptized every one of you for remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31, God commands all men everywhere to repent. Sin is universal. The cure is universal too. And the requirements to meet the, the demands of the gospel are bound on everyone. No one's left out. There's not one gospel for the Jews and one gospel for the Gentiles. They had a big problem with that in the first century. That a good portion of the New Testament is written to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ being unique and universal. In fact, in Jude 3, Jude says, When I gave all diligence to write unto you regarding the common salvation, common salvation, that doesn't mean it's plain or ordinary. That simply means it's common to everybody. It's available to all. And then he says, as, as important as that is, Wonder right to you about the common salvation, what we're talking about here this morning. He said it was needful that I should write unto you and exhort you to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints. This message is so important that we have to defend it. Because there are a lot of people out there that would corrupt it and change it and pervert it. And a corrupt, changed, perverted gospel cannot save. Actual repentance is, is, is a breaking down of the stubborn will of man that is the seed of all sin and rebellion against God. When a person truly repents, a decision of the mind is made that leads to a change of life. They will cease living a life devoted to the practice of sin and begin living a life that's devoted to the practice of righteousness and submission to God and to His Son, Jesus Christ. Being baptized into Christ addresses the state of sin. Outside of Christ, one is in the state of being dead in sin. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. The gospel includes the command to be baptized, Mark 16, verse 15 and 16. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Notice once again the universal nature of the gospel and whose responsibility it is to get that message out. That falls to you and me, not just the preacher and the elders, but that's the responsibility of each and every one of us. But go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Similar statement in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. Baptism changes one's spiritual state. It's in baptism that one is put into Christ. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. In Christ, 
One is dead to sin and not dead in sin. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Remember, God promised to save us from our sins and not in our sins. Thus one receives God's promise of the remission of sin. And this addresses the guilt of sin. Remission of sins is the promise to those who repent and are baptized. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. You know, remission is an old word that we don't use much anymore in the English language. But I remember when I was a child, my parents used to get a bill, and at the bottom of the bill it would say, you, it, the, the amounts say $10. It says, please remit $10. That was the, the payment that they need. They need to remit that. And then when they would pay that $10, they get a receipt and say remitted. We have a debt. And that debt that we owe, according to Romans 6 and verse 23, is death. We have a debt we can't pay. Jesus paid that debt for us when He died on the cross. And we offer the invitation Every time I get up and preach, I'm not going to do it this morning. We don't have an invitation song, but when we think about the invitation, we offer that invitation to encourage people to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fact that He did die on the cross, that He was buried and raised the third day for remission of our sins according to the Scriptures. And then we encourage people to respond to that. By being buried with Him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, that old man of sin Dead and on the other side of the baptistry. That's repentance. We died to sin. We're buried with Christ. And we're raised to walk in that new life. The gospel truly is the answer to the sin problem. Thank you. Well, what better way to start off any day?